Hello, and welcome to Girls for Greatness. I am your host, Delia Perry, and I am on a mission to help you rock a life empowered by your own greatness. This show features the incredible stories of women who have overcome their own struggles in order to find triumphant success. It is my hope that their stories will inspire and motivate you to do whatever it takes to live the life you really and truly were meant to live. My friends, my friends, welcome to another episode of the Girls for Greatness podcast. I am your host, Delia Perry, and you are tuning in to episode number 177 with Randy Braun. I am so looking forward to this empowering, inspiring episode with someone that I know many of you will relate to. Randy is a speaker, CEO of the leadership coaching and advisory firm, Something Major, and the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Something Major, The New Playbook for Women at Work. Randy specializes with women and working moms. She is a certified executive coach as well as a consultant. Randy is an expert at helping women leaders thrive in demanding and unpredictable high performance and high volume environments. Randy is a thought leader who has been featured by Forbes, The Washington Post, Parents Magazine, Thrive Global, and the Chicago Tribune. Randy speaks frequently on the topics of women's professional development and leadership, thriving in working parenthood, avoiding burnout, business development, and building meaningful professional relationships. My friends, I cannot wait to dive into this conversation with Randy. So with that, Randy, welcome to the Girls for Greatness podcast. It's so wonderful to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me, Delia. Yes. Uh, Well, tell us where you're coming at us from today. Yeah, well, I'm joining you today from Washington, D.C., and it's one of the 10 days a year where we get this little break between a freezing winter and a sweltering (laughs) summer. So I'm enjoying every moment of being here. The book tour stars align that I got to be off the road for a few of these days, and I am luxuriating in it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I can't wait to dive in to talk a little bit more about your book. But tell me a little about maybe your journey to how you even started something major, like what led you to that? And uh, just maybe a little about your history and in in business and and your background. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up professionally in business development. I thought that was my first, it was my first love, thought we were going to be forever, wanted to be the chief revenue officer of a company. And something funny happened along the way. I didn't fall out of love for a second in that career. But what did happen was that I had two babies Mm. in two years and six days, Mm. Mm. (laughs) which was wild. Wow! And listen, we both know, and many of your listeners do as well, that social science tells us that during that time, my earning potential should have either plateaued or it should have decreased. But Mm. I had the opposite. Mm. I doubled my compensation in those two years Mm. and six days. And so what you need to know about DC is that for everything you might hear in the media, we're actually just the world's biggest small town. That's how I describe (laughs) us. Wow. And what happened was my story got around. And so people were calling me, asking me to coffee, asking me to speak on panel. Um, And what I learned really quickly, Delia, was that number one, they really didn't want to hear my story. They wanted help writing theirs. Mm. And number two, I was so much more interested in their stories than I were about when I was about my own. So I got curious about coaching. Started my business in earnest, um, was at the time the director of enterprise sales at DC's largest homegrown tech startup, had two under three, you know, had wow. started this coaching certification program, and I just couldn't do it all at the same time. And um, it was a boss of mine who took me out to breakfast to try and poach me from an old job to a new job. And he ended up interventioning me, and he was like, You got to take this thing full time. Quit my job six weeks later. Took the business full time a hundred days before the start of the pandemic. Had no idea what was going to happen. Wow. And about three years to the day that the world shut down, my book, Something Major: The New Playbook for Women at Work, hit the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. It's definitely wild. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. It's for wild. sure. <laughs> for sure. So was it? Uh, tell me a little bit about maybe the challenges that you faced as you kind of branched off and started doing your own thing. Oh my God, how much time do we have? (laughs) Um, I mean, so it was a fascinating time because, you know, I'm actually, and I write about this in the book, I'm a recovering risk avoider. 
Mm. I don't like risk. Mm. I operate often from a place, you know, my default operating system, it has a lot of fear and anxiety in it. Mm. Um, and so I feel like everything that I've gone through in the last three years, you know, in addition to building my business, in addition to helping women, it has honestly helped build the best version of me. That's the gift that entrepreneurship mm. has given me, um, is not being able to be propped up by the external validation of a boss. Uh, not be able to depend on other people for my validation. Um, and so what it was, what happened was, you know, I was very nervous to take the business full time to give up a, a lucrative career, a career mm. I was, you know, objectively successful at adding insult to injury. You know, at the time now in the pandemic, I have a one and a half year old and a three and a half year old about 40 days before the world shut down. My husband quit his job at mm. one of the world's biggest and oldest technology companies to be the first hire at a startup. Wow. And so when the world shut down, we just looked at each other and we were like, what is going to happen? <laughs> um, <laughs> his company ended up, you know, doing incredibly well. Um, and I'm still proud of everything he accomplished while helping support and build my career. But I feel like it was just the time where we just turned to each other and we were like, we need to depend on each other. We need to communicate. We need to stay open about how we're feeling. And I feel like we really depended on each other. And as two people in small business, Celia, at the time, I mm. feel like we were honest, and I don't use this word often. I felt like we were very blessed to have mm. two businesses that quickly in the pandemic both pivoted and were doing really well. And that kind of created its own host of challenges because mm. like we both wanted to work eight, nine, maybe even 10 hours a day, but we only got four. And this was my, my college boyfriend that I ended up marrying. Mm. And I'll just never forget, you know, we'd each get four hours during the day. And then we would basically put the kids down, eat a quick dinner. And we would sit at the table with our laptops working on it. And I turned to my husband that first week and I was like, doesn't this kind of remind you of working together in college in the library? So we joke, you know, as much as things change, I suppose they stay the same. That's awesome. That's awesome. Wow. That's really cool. Uh, and so great that he could, you know, come alongside you and, uh, and help and, uh, you guys could do that together and build that together. That's really awesome. So uh, tell me a little about your, your new book now, something major, the playbook for women at work. Why did you decide to write that? How did that come about? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, in deep COVID, I was having a conversation with a woman and even though she was home alone, it's like she whispered to confess to me. She said, I just have no desire. Mm. I can't even remember the last time I was in the mood. Mm. And she wasn't talking about what some of your listeners think she was talking about. Mm. She was talking about a passion for work mm. um, and for her career that she had lost. I mean, Celia, she had played by all the old rules. She had done everything right. She had gone to Harvard for graduate school mm. and still, even though she was at what should have been this apex moment in her career and her leadership journey, she was feeling uninspired. And I was just like, wow, mm. this is really what I'm hearing every single day put into words in a way that just clicked for me. This woman had a case of low work libido. Mm. And unfortunately, there's just no little blue pill for that, right? Mm. And so I was like, okay, I'm talking to women about this every single day. I'm kind of playing around with these new rules, these new ideas. And that's when it really came to me. I was like, you know what? Women really do need a new playbook for how we can thrive at work on our own terms. I mean, I said this two years before the research that just came out showed that, you know, women are leading now in droves at the, at the middle and senior management level. Hmm. Um, we just can't sustain playing by the old rules we've been taught. And my greatest hope is that the women who pick up this book will not just, I think, laugh, hopefully at some of the stories, like you will laugh, you will cry, I tell some very vulnerable stories about myself in this book, um, but really feel empowered with very tactical, human, no BS tools to start not writing my playbook for yourself, but writing your own. Hmm. Mm. That's awesome. I love that phrase, low work, <laughs> work libido. That's awesome. Um, and I think there's a lot of people listening that can definitely relate. Uh, I think even <laughs> just no matter what we're doing, I think there's there's many who can relate uh, to just maybe feeling uh, stuck or feeling like, uh, like you said, like there's just very little passion for whatever it is that we're doing. And that I think is something that so many shove to the side they don't want to deal with. I know I've been in that position as well. And it's so easy to just plow through and move on to the next quote unquote, next thing. 
uh, on our to-do list, but it's definitely, uh, definitely something we all need to heed, I think, and, and pay attention to. I'm going um, to say one thing about that too. Yeah. I was just, before we move on, if, if that's okay with you. No, of you know, course. I was just talking to a client yesterday and she's like, I'm so exhausted. I'm going to quit my job. Mm. And, you know, for months we've been working on boundaries, which is something I write about in the book that I know you and I are going to talk about. We've been writing, you know, talking about designing your goals, owning your message, like all the things that are in the book, because I wrote that book based on the work I've been doing with my coaching clients for years. Right. Mm. And I told her, I said, listen, I was like, you're not allowed to quit your job until you quit your bad habits Mm. because your relationship with your boundaries, your relationship with how you take fear and the need for external validation with you, that's, that's not unique to this job, which by the way, is extremely high paying, extremely lucrative, has great benefits for where she is in her life. Um, And I said to her, I was like, you got to quit those bad habits before you quit this job. I was like, listen, you're the boss. But you pay me to help you hold you to your goals. Mm. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I, if I didn't raise that to you. Mm. And I think that's something we all need to remember. Because in the early days of my entrepreneurship journey, I took so many of the bad habits I had in my own work life, right? For me, and I tell the very personal story in the, in the book about my own relationship with external validation. Like I took the need to be validated by others into my business. Mm. Um, you know, to a certain degree. And I learned really quickly that I needed to outgrow it. And it was such a gift for me. Mm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, there's so many different things I could dive into here. I want to do want to touch on this area of boundaries because I've I've talked a little bit about it on here before with other guests, but I think it's just something that we have a really hard time with uh, as women. And um, it was one of the things I noted actually kind of just even looking through your own social media, yeah. Randy, was just how well you speak to that and how well, you know, you address it in, in our example. And I'm, and I'm just curious, I guess, what your take on that is and how you set your own personal boundaries and maybe even how you start to guide the women you work with in that area. I just laughed as you were talking about that because I was like, yes, I talk about this on social media all the time. I talk about boundaries to anyone who will listen to yeah. me all the time. In fact, an article I wrote years ago about boundaries was the first kind of like aha moment for me of like, huh, I felt like I had to work so hard to cut this down to like a, a thousand words. I could have written yeah. 5,000 words and yeah. you know what? that's a book chapter. So listen, um, I think there are so many things we could cover on boundaries. I'm going to walk through a few kind of quick hits of ideas here. Um, Number one, I think it's so important to understand, like, one, what motivates us to bust Mm. our own boundaries, Mm. right? Because this is just human behavior 101. We don't do anything if there's no reward. And in my experience, there's a few reasons. Number one, um, we actually do get rewarded for it in our workplaces. Like, I remember working in a workplace in my 20s where it's like that lack of boundaries overwork was was rewarded in promotions, in praise, in raises. So I learned early on that busting my own boundaries was rewarding. Um, and certainly rewarded by others. Number two is we oftentimes let fear masquerade as the voice of reason. So mm. we tend to fear, um, you know, that if we basically disappoint other people, that that's going to be a problem. We say, oh, that's just my voice of reason. That's making me successful. No, that's actually your fear talking. And then number three is we we totally get the cost calculus wrong. So we tend to overestimate how much busting our own boundaries are going to give us a reward. And we tend to underestimate the cost to us personally Mm. until, you know, like I talked about this in my book, like your hair starts falling out of Mm. your head and you're like, oh, maybe this isn't working. Um, And then just one other thing I'll say about boundaries when it comes to designing effective boundaries, like I want to remind everyone who's listening, you have permission to say no. And the more you Mm. say no, the easier it is. It's like building up a muscle. Mm -hmm. But I also understand sometimes Delia that saying no feels hard. And one of my best hacks for saying no is to borrow the golden rule of improv and to say yes and when you get a request that you want to say no to. So when someone asks you, can you help with something? Yes, I would love to help with that. And I'm on deadline this week. I would be glad to turn to this next Tuesday. Yes, Mm. I would love to take on that project this quarter. And why don't we sit down on Friday that we can review what my priorities are for the rest of the year or the rest of the performance period. And I can make sure that my attention is spent in the right places because this is making my plate feel fuller than I expected. Mm, mm, That's great. That's a great tip. Yes. And no, that's awesome. 
I uh, love those suggestions too, as far as boundaries go. And use it in your personal life. Like, yes, yeah. I'd love to help, you know, wherever right. you are in your community, if it's the soccer team, if it's your church or synagogue, like, yes, I'd love to help set up for the community lunch on Sunday. And I will not be able to get there until 1130. Or yes, I'd love to help. And my contribution will be that I will Instacart some Costco juice boxes. Yeah, right, right. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm I'm curious what your take is on how as women we can I guess maybe start to win at both and I know this kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, the topic of boundaries but um, how we can win right. at both uh you know our our work and our personal life or even if we even you know we're more specific and said you know as our um life as a mother you know for those of us who have kids and just I yeah. guess that whole melding of those two can be really difficult, as you know. I mean, being, um, you know, a working mother entrepreneur, you know, so you, uh, you obviously, yes, boundaries are a part of it. But what are some of the other things that you like to to bring to the forefront in that area? Yeah, and I feel this right. I mean, I am a entrepreneur. I'm on my book tour right now. I'm home for ten of the thirty one days of April. Are there thirty or thirty one days in this month? I don't even know. <laughs> I'm on the road, right, and. I'm married to a technology executive, right? So like he's got his own thriving career. We've got two kids in school. We don't have any other help really um, for childcare aside from the days that they spend in school. So I feel that number one, I want to remind you, if you are trying to do it all, you're leaving something on the table Mm -hmm. because overwork saps your creativity. It saps your productivity. It saps your sense of fulfillment. This is not my opinion. This is research from Dr. Ashley Willens at Harvard Business School. Okay. So this isn't a nice platitude. This is science. And it's so important to remember that like we can't martyr ourselves because when we do that, we leave our performance, we leave our earning potential, we leave our Mm. happiness on the table. And for me, Delia, I feel like my kids deserve Mm -hmm. a better version of me. Mm -hmm. Like last night, everything inside of me was screaming, like, you need to take a break. If you tell your partner, he'll support you. And I was just like the worst version of myself to my kids last night because I was like, well, I only have 10 nights with them, you know, Mm. in our home this month. And I want to like make it great. It was horrible. You know what I mean? Like Mm. they don't deserve that from me. Um, I also like to think about, this was advice that someone else gave to me. Um, I like to think about life in seasons. So right now Mm. I just can't have balance in my life right now. I'm on a book tour and it would be an unfair standard to think that I'm going to be the best mom or the, the most present mom I can be. I try and think about the quality of time I have with my kids right now. I try and make sure they feel loved by me. But I'm also in this incredible season of busyness and book touring at work. I planned when I planned my book tour that I'm taking the whole summer off from work. Right. Right. Um, And sometimes that's what balance looks like is chunking seasons. It's so important. My kids feel loved by me. And then the last thing I'll say, because it relates to the book and it relates to whether everyone's listening as a mom or not, I think it comes down to just getting so intentional about what we're saying yes to and what we're saying no Mm. to. And oftentimes, We have to work hard to say yes to something, right? I always say goals are hard. Otherwise, it'd be something you did last week or back in 2012. Mm. And we have to get intentional about those yeses. And then we have to protect those yeses with no. Mm. Things we're going to say no to. And it's okay to fail. Like, I just was like not the best quality mom I was last night to my kids. And I don't judge myself for that. I take that as like, I woke up this morning and I was like, okay, game plan. How are you going to be so present with your kids? today. Mm. Like what's the game plan to bring a better version of yourself? Mm. And that was how I interacted with them. And it's also how I comport myself through my day when they're not around to preserve my energy for them. Mm. Love that. Love that. And love that whole suggestion about getting intentional with your yes and using your no as a, as a protector of those yeses. That's, that's awesome. And very true. How do you think we as women can tap more into our our own sense of of confidence and maybe even our confidence in our own personal message and what we're trying to to do with our life. Yes. I'm so glad that you asked me about this. I write three chapters in the book about confidence. <laughs> um, awesome. You know, I think cracking the confidence code is one of the most important things that we need to be able to do. Like to me, they're the first three chapters of the book because they're so foundational to writing our own new playbook. And the first thing we need to do, Delia, is number one, we've got to ditch this idea of imposter syndrome. Mm. Um, the academic research shows that when we use the term imposter syndrome, it not only makes us less confident, but it 
basically lets our workplaces and the systemic inequities that all women face, um, you know, especially I would argue women of color, um, it, it lets our cultures off the hook on that. Instead, and it, it makes us internalize the fact that we go to work every day in a system that was not built for our success. And so what I want women to do is to basically unhook from this idea of imposter syndrome and get to know who your inner critic is. We all mm. have one. It doesn't make you mm. deficient. It mm. makes you human. Yeah. And all our inner critic is Delia is it's the voice of self-doubt and the voice of self-judgment, but it is also just our internal risk mechanism. Mm. And all our inner critic is trying to keep us safe from is, you know, what I call the Long Island ice of fear. It's that mashup of embarrassment, risk, vulnerability, mm. failure. Um, and it's okay. I mean, I'm not such a Long Island ice team at girl myself. It's okay to sip on that, right? Because a little bit of fear to detect the risk is really helpful to help us identify the problem so we can solve it, right? Maybe we do need to prepare more for that interview. Maybe we do need to prepare better um, for that big presentation we have at work. However, we don't want to get drunk on that Long Island ice tea of fear. Mm. And that's why getting to know who your inner critic is, like, what does your inner critic sound like? Because when you can essentially identify it as a data point or as a perspective, it allows you to be at choice in identifying a new perspective that you want to move forward with. Um, for me, I feel like my inner critic is in some ways louder than ever, not because I'm driven by fear, but because I've learned to almost tune the frequency of what she sounds like so that I can hear her, acknowledge her, comfort her, and let mm. her go. Mm. Um, and that's really a gift for me is getting mm. to know my inner critic because I think we want to banish self-doubt. Whereas I want us to reframe that self-doubt is an opportunity to get curious and to pivot into problem-solving mode. Because your inner critic, final thought here, Delia, she's a phenomenal problem identifier. She's a horrible problem solver. Mm. Mm. That's great. No, that's that's phenomenal. I love that. I love that. Reframing your self-doubt. And this is the final thing I'll say. It's like when we let our inner critic try and solve the problem, all she does is minimize failure. She doesn't maximize success. And those are two different things. But back to you. I just wanted to. No, I love that. I love that. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I love it. And and there's, you guys, so many amazing topics that I know Randy has included in her book. And I will have all of that uh, linked, of course, in the show notes for you. So my final couple of questions that I kind of end each podcast with. First one, tell me three words that best describe who you really and truly are. Fun, friend, connector. Oh, love those. Love those. Those are great, friend. I love that. Tell me one thing you are currently working on to improve in your own life. I'm bringing meditation back mm, into the fold of my self-care. Mm, that's and great. I'm obsessed right now with this idea of habit stacking, which mm-hmm. is like when you want to start a new habit, you stack it onto another habit that's already really sticky. Yes. And I'm having incredible success with that. And some days, like my meditation practice is meh, um, but I try and show up for five to 10 minutes. And I do feel, you know, I'm a na- native New Yorker, so I was cynical in meditation for a long time. Apparently, all the science is right about meditation. So I'm enjoying that right that's now. That's awesome. To get that. That's awesome. I have something I've actually started to implement as well. It's it's not doesn't come easy for me, but I'm same same thing. I think it's great to be able to stack that on top of something else that's working. And my last question: Tell me one thing you are proud of yourself for being or doing. Ooh, one thing of myself. One thing I'm proud of for being or doing. I'm really proud of myself for staying true to me. Mm. And. I'll just elaborate on that for mm, a second. Yeah, please. Um, really in my coaching business, something major, I played it safe. I only wrote about things I thought that people would want to hear, only told stories um, that I felt safe about. And about two, two and a half years ago, I just started getting more unfiltered. And I'm kind of like a naturally like funny person. I feel like I was turning down the volume on that in the early days. I'm a little cheeky, a little edgy, sometimes a little irreverent. Mm. And I just started slowly turning up the volume on me. Mm. And what I have found in my business is that I have been rewarded for lack of a better term for that. And it feels so incredible to feel like I just get to wake up and be me. Not that I wasn't being authentic before, 
but I didn't trust myself to be as authentic as I feel I give myself permission to be today to just like Delia I'm gonna spoil this like if anyone now <laughs> follows me on social media you will notice this half of my social media content posts honest to god have typos in them because I go on my morning walk that's actually the habit Delia that I've stacked that <laughs> meditation practice on top of I go on my morning walk and usually I just like post on social media, like what's ever on my mind. Like I don't have like a fancy calendar. Um, right. I don't have like a queue. And honestly, like I find that the things I'm almost like, oh, can I even post this on social? Not in an overshare way, but maybe it's like a little edgy or it's like a funny metaphor. Right. Right. Get the most engagement. And so for everyone who's listening, I encourage you to just think about today. You know, in my book, I talk about like small ways you can say yes and say no, making 1% moves in your day. Like I really challenge you to think about like where you can just like click up the volume, just 1% on you right. and on fun. And yeah, that's something I feel really proud of myself, especially like final, final thought PPS is, you know, hitting the wall street journal bestseller list has been amazing. And I find that when you hit an accolade like that, there are so many things people want from you or expect of you. Mm. Um, and I feel like it's really challenged me and strengthened my resolve and just staying true to me. So that's something that I'm really proud of. That's awesome. That's awesome. No, I love that. And it's such a great reminder to all of us. Thank you so much, Randy, for being here. I've so oh loved God, this conversation you. and have taken so many awesome notes. And I am I know that uh, this will just be um, so impactful on on my listeners and, and many others. And I love the work you're doing and just really commend you for for uh, tapping into what is uh, unique to you and just being so willing to share it with the world. So it's, it's just awesome. And I've loved this conversation. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Delia. My friends, what an honor it has been to bring you this episode of the Girls for Greatness podcast. I so appreciate you taking the time to tune in. And I so appreciate Randy's willingness to share her journey and wisdom with us. Building the best version of you, my friends. That is what I decided to title this episode because I think Randy gave us so many beautiful ideas and ways we can do just that. Some of them that stood out to me were to know our own inner critic, to reframe self-doubt, to ditch imposter syndrome, to get intentional with our yeses and to protect those yeses with our nos, to pay attention to what saps us of our energy, to pay attention if we are experiencing quote unquote, low work libido, and to always be sure to stay true to yourself. Such wonderful advice. Please be sure to check out the show notes for all the info on how you can find and follow Randy over on social media, as well as all the info on how you can check out her website, as well as her new book, Something Major, the new playbook for women at work. And let me just leave you all with the reminder that you, yes, you have so much to offer this amazing world of ours. And if you're having that sort of day where you're struggling to find the positive or even the good within yourself, well, I'm here to remind you that it's there. You have something unique to give to this world that only you can give in your own unique and special way. So keep pressing on, keep doing the work, because your unique, beautiful, powerful greatness matters. And you are more than worthy of living the life you really and truly were meant to live.